Good evening, friends, honored guests, members of our courts, both uh, real and moot. My name is Michael Marin, and I'm the Acting Dean of Law at UNB. I'm very happy to welcome you to the first ever virtual edition of the William Henry Harrison Moot Court Competition. I begin by respectfully acknowledging that UNB Law stands on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of Wolostoque. The lands of the Wabanaki people are recognized in a series of peace and friendship treaties to establish an ongoing relationship of peace, friendship, and mutual respect between equal nations. The river that runs by our university is known as Wolustuk, along which live Wolustukwig, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. Wolustuk is also called the St. John River. So tonight we commemorate the life and contributions of the Honorable William Henry Harrison, a former judge and former dean of our law school. At UMB Law, this commemoration takes two forms, the compulsory first year moot program and this evening's event, the William Henry Harrison competition, which is in its 58th year. This competition will see the four students who received the top grades in the oral advocacy component of the first year mooting program compete for the honor of the Harrison Shield. The Harrison Moot is also the cornerstone of our mooting program, which in upper years uh, involves competitive moots in which students represent UNB law in competitions involving other law schools. And in recent years, our competitive mooting program has really taken flight with impressive placings at several competitions, including the Gale, the McKelvey Cup, the Jessup, the Wilson, and the Canadian National Negotiation Competition. I wanna thank the faculty co-chairs of our mooting committee, Professors Brock and Thompson, for their outstanding work over the last several years, which includes organizing tonight's event. I also want to thank our mooting coaches who volunteer hundreds of hours of their time each year to give our students an unforgettable experience. And an extra special thank you to Ed Bowes, our public engagement officer, David Anderson, our program support officer, and Kelsey Lockyer, our technology assistants, for taking care of all of the logistics for this evening's event. As you can imagine, putting on a virtual mood with people all across Canada is no small feat, and we thank them very much for their hard work putting this together. So through competitive mooting, our students develop skills and life lessons, oral and written advocacy, legal analysis, time management, teamwork, and confidence. Mooting is also an opportunity for us to showcase our faculty so we can de demonstrate the exceptional quality of our program, the brilliance of our students and inspire pride in our community. So to our new students who started law school just a few weeks ago, I hope that tonight's event encourages you to give mooting a try. Tonight, we're also joined by our alumni who are watching all across Canada. Welcome, and I hope that watching this isn't too re-traumatizing for you. In all seriousness, this is the first of many events in which we're gonna use technology to engage our alumni, the legal community, and our friends across uh, UNB. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our very distinguished panel of judges. Chief Justice of the Court of Queen's Bench, the Honorable Tracy DeWare. The Honorable Justice Kathleen Quigg of the New Brunswick Court of Appeal and former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Thomas Cromwell. Thank you to each of you for agreeing to judge our competition. We're honored that you're here. Let me introduce our competitors this evening. Counsel for the appellant are Alden Spencer and Lucas Savini. Counsel for the respondent are Aaron Connolly and Matthew Smith. I'd also like to thank Rebecca Buxton and Daniel Escott, both second year students, for their assistance with the problem this summer. Daniel Escott is tonight's ceremonial clerk. We're also grateful to have with us this evening, 
one of William Henry Harrison's grandchildren, Mr. William Teed QC. Mr. Teed graduated from UND Law in 1978 and is a partner in the St. John office of Cox and Palmer. His practice focuses on business and corporate commercial law, corporate finance, real property development, financing, and energy. Bill is also a generous supporter of UNB Law, including the prize for this competition, and we're very grateful for his commitment to our faculty. So I'd like to now invite Mr. Teed to come up and say a few words about his grandfather, William Henry Harrison. Thank you very much, Dean. Chief Justice DeWare, Justice Quigg, Justice Cromwell, Mooters, friends of UMB Law, and alumni across the country. It's, uh, it is indeed an honor to be here this evening to uh, talk about my grandfather, a gentleman that unfortunately I don't remember. I was only two years old when he passed away but uh, my mother insisted that I be named after him, and so I was, and here I am practicing law as he did. I always wondered whether it was my mother's direction that I was practicing law or whether I really was gonna love this profession, and then thankfully, when I got to law school and started to practice, I most thoroughly do enjoy it, and uh, glad that uh, she pushed me in that direction. My grandfather was born in 1880, and uh, he passed away in 1955, and at the time, he was a justice of the Court of Appeal of New Brunswick, but also the dean of the law school. I'm told by many that he was one of the most respected jurists of his time, a man's man and a gentleman, and who had a true interest in not only law, but his community in general. And in those days, justices of the court still participated in outside community organizations. Uh, not something that's allowed today, but uh, he was and they were, and he certainly made uh, every effort to be a good community citizen. The SHIELD competition was established uh, by his brother, Jim Harrison. And really it, it was our great uncle Jim, who we all called uncle Jim, that really wanted an honor to be bestowed something that would last a long, a long time, a legacy, but involved his, the faculty of law, of which my grandfather was uh, loved to the, the, to the extent that one could possibly love uh, a school and the profession. So it was established and presented to the president of the day, Colin B. Mackay, I think it was 1964. I think we've made comment that it was, uh, this is the 58th anniversary of this competition. Uh, which is a quite a, a long, that has, certainly has longevity. He went to a private school, Rossi Collegiate College in uh, St. John area, where he was, uh, he got the school gold medal for academic performance two years in a row, graduated with his Bachelor of Arts from UMB in 1900. He distinguished himself at UMB with the alumni gold medal in 1899. And in 1990, uh, sorry, 1900, the Douglas Gold Medal uh, was awarded to him. He graduated from Harvard Law School in 1903, was admitted uh, to the bar in probably, uh, in those days, I believe you were first admitted as a solicitor and then a barrister, and became a partner in the law firm of Powell and Harrison. As we all know, the First World War uh, occurred, and for five years, he was in Europe, where he, distinguished himself uh, as Lieutenant Colonel, and he did receive Distinguished Service Medal for gallantry and was certainly mentioned in many dispatches. When he returned after the war, he joined uh, the firm of Barnhill, Sanford and Harrison, which is a predecessor to my firm, Cox and Palmer. And uh, we do have a room in his honor at the office. Eventually, uh, public service, uh, lured him into the political world where he was elected as a member of the Legislative Assembly in 1931. In 33, he was appointed Attorney General of the province. And like so many uh, politicians of the day, the Depression hit 
and those in power didn't do so well. So he was uh, defeated and uh, shortly thereafter was appointed to the Supreme Court of New Brunswick as a Justice of the Court of Appeal. Interestingly enough, in 1947, he did become Dean of the law school. This law school in those days was in St. John and there were no full-time professors. All of the professors were practicing lawyers uh, and he was a lecturer uh, during that uh, time and was Dean until his death in 1955. And it was only in 1955 that UNB uh, had its first full-time professor in William Ryan, uh, who was Dean, uh, George McAllister uh, joined, and Jerry LaFourier eventually. Well, Bill Ryan became Justice William Ryan of the federal court. And we all know that Jerry LaFourier became Mr. Justice LaFourier of the Supreme Court of Canada. So uh, there were pretty good uh, full-time professors to really kickstart the, the law school on a professional basis. Eventually the law school moved to Fredericton and eventually these facilities. As I mentioned, he was a member of many organizations, including the Senate of this university and all the affiliates that go with that. He was given two honorary degrees, one at UNB, Doctor of uh, Civil Law and University of Kings for the Doctorate of Canon Law. On a more personal note, as I mentioned, I do not remember him, but I certainly remember all of the humanitarian type stories from my brothers and sisters who did and do remember his kindness, his love as a grandfather, and just being a great, wonderful person to so many students that still would come up to me and say, you know, one of the best teachers I ever had, did a great job, cared about students and what they were doing. So indeed, uh, it is a pleasure to be here for this 58th moot competition. Good luck to the mooters. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. On behalf of myself and my co-panelists, Justice Thomas Cromwell and Kathleen Quigg, we would like to welcome all individuals with business before the Privy Council of Beaverbrook this afternoon. Today, we will be hearing the matter of Uber, Uber Technologies Inc., Uber Canada Inc., Uber BV, and Raise Your Operations BV appellants, and David Heller, respondent. Court file number 9-2020 PC. May we have the appearances, please? Good afternoon, Chief Justice and Justices. My name is Alden Spencer, and myself and my co-counsel, Lucas Savini, are appearing on behalf of the appellants, Uber Technologies, Uber Canada, Uber BV and Razier Operations BV, who we will be refer re collectively referring, sorry, to as Uber. And my friends, Matthew Smith and Aaron Connolly are appearing on behalf of the respondent, Mr. David Heller. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Are the appellants ready to proceed with their submissions? Yes, Chief Justice. Uh, as you know, there has been an agreed statement of facts submitted to the court. Would you like a recital of the facts this evening? I'm, I don't believe we need that. Do either of the other uh, panelists believe that's necessary? No, I think that's, uh, that's fine, uh, Ms. Spencer, if you'd like to uh, get right into the submissions. Thank you very much, Chief, Chief Justice. Uh, today, Uber is appealing their case on two grounds. First, that the Supreme Court of Canada majority, or SCC, did err in defining the test for unconscionability. And second, that they did err in determining that the arbitration clause in question was unconscionable. I will be covering the issue of the test of unconscionability, while my co-counsel, Mr. Savini, will handle the second ground of appeal before the court today. Uber respectfully submits that the majority erred in defining the test for unconscionability on two grounds. Firstly, the case law that currently exists in Canada supports a knowledge requirement in the test for unconscionability following the rise in, in popularity of, of standard form contracts or SFCs. And secondly, the test as it stands written by the majority presents an unreasonably low threshold that will result in nearly every SFC being considered unconscionable. As Justice Sapinka acknowledged, the, con the doctrine of unconscionability has yet to be settled law in Canada, and it is constantly evolving, given the constant evolving of contracts themselves. Uh, Ms. Spencer, if I can just stop you there for a moment. Um, I I'm not sure that we can say it's, it's unresolved. If, if you think that uh, 
Justice Lafore, who, as you know, is very dear to this particular court, set out a definition back in 92, which the Supreme Court of Canada seemed to remain quite comfortable with uh, 25 years later in 2017, where in 2020, not a whole lot has changed since then. Why is there a need to revisit the issue at this point? Uh, thank you very much, Chief Justice. Uh, respectfully, the majority didn't adopt an unconscionability uh, test in 2017 in Duez. They decided that on public policy, it was a concurring judgment that accepted that test of unconscionability. And Uber would submit that given the rise in SFCs with the increase in online transactions, particularly in the quick nature of today's industry, SFCs have become more and more commonplace. And because it is the law of contracts, not contract, as the law evolves and as the nature of contracts evolves, the law must evolve along with that. So Ms. Spencer, how does this majority decision from the Supreme Court of Canada affect standard form contracts in general? So as the majority's test in Heller is presented, they don't have a knowledge requirement and they only require an improvident bargain, not a grossly unfair and improvident bargain. So without this knowledge requirement, simply an inequality in the parties and their bargaining power, by definition, the standard form contract doesn't have any negotiations. One party presents the terms as they exist and the other is free to accept or reject them in their entirety. They don't really get the option to go back and forth. So Uber would submit that because there is no negotiation, that would amount to an inequality in bargaining power as one party has all the power to set the terms and the other does not. However, if they include knowingly taking advantage of that power differentiation to the weak, the stronger's benefit, sorry, that would let some SFCs get through. And then also with the second ground, because they aren't qualifying it to say it needs to be grossly unfair and improvident bargain, with such a low threshold of improvidence, any bargain that is not completely 100% beneficial to both parties would be considered unconscionable under this agreement. So a standard form contract, for example, that doesn't have any bargaining power as standard form contracts don't. And if one party gains even a little bit more than the other, that could be considered improvident as it's not, you're not getting the same as what you're receiving. So SFCs could be sweepingly determined as unconscionable. And the Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just no, go ahead, just finish your answer, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that the dissent in Heller did recognize that this did amount to a sweeping move on unconscionability and SFCs. And if that is what is supposed to be happening, if SFCs aren't supposed to be allowed in commercial nature, um, the court is not to decide that. That's up to the legislature to make that sweeping move. And Duez also recognized that in 2017, that sweeping moves such as this must be left to the legislature, not up to the court. Justice Cromwell, your question. Just interrupt once uh, more. The majority of the Supreme Court of Canada in paragraph 56 of their reasons set out what they took to be the underlying rationale for freedom of courts respecting the freedom of contract. One, that the parties uh, freely negotiate the exchange and they're autonomous and self-interested. And the court says neither of those conditions is met in a case like this one. What's wrong with that reasoning, if anything? Um, Uber would submit that the, the issue with that reasoning is if given the Supreme Court of Canada's test, there is no freedom to contract because automatically SFCs will be deemed unconscionable. And because they are deemed automatically unconscionable, a weaker party would never be able to enter into a contract with a, smart, a, a larger party or vice versa. If even at your daily coffee shop, you go in and you ask for your coffee, you don't have to negotiate the terms of that every single day. You are free to enter in that contract of, yes, I wanna take this or no, I don't wanna take this. Um, and freedom to contract is limited in the majority's test because you can only agree to bargains that are completely um, equal in terms of what you're getting and what you're receiving and what you're giving. Um, and you can also only enter into contracts with parties that have equal bargaining power. So you, a little guy can't enter, can't enter into a contract with a large corporation or vice versa because they would be considered to have an inequality of bargaining power. 
So any contract, even not just SFCs, but any particular contract could be deemed uh, unconscionable due to that power differentiation. Exaggerating the impact of the judgment, because, for example, in paragraph 76, the majority writes that the emphasis in assessing improvidence should be on whether the stronger party has been unduly enriched. That doesn't sound like an overcharging a quarter on a cup of coffee to me. That is fair, uh, Justice. However, I, Uber would submit and would argue that it is possible with the current definition if the judge just saw that the test was an improvident bargain, well, you could be unduly, um, it could be an undue circumstance depending on the circumstances of the party. But with this grossly unfair qualifier, you're preventing frivolous suits. So you're not limiting people who have legitimate claims from coming forward because if it was an undue advantage, then they would be able to, to proceed anyways under the grossly unfair uh, category. However, if you could try and squeeze an argument almost into saying that it is um, that it is as it should be, then you're, you're not going towards the proper course. And the Court of Appeal did recognize this in Saskatchewan and in Newfoundland, uh, in uh, Hess and also in Input Capital Corp. Both courts did realize that mere inequality between the parties was insufficient to determine that they had an unequal bargain and therefore the doctrine of unconscionability could be invoked. And as my co-counsel, Mr. Savini will argue, because there was more than an inequality in bargaining power between Uber and uh, Mr. Heller, then the doctrine of unconscionability doesn't come into play in this particular case. Additionally, um, in the knowledge requirement, the Court of Appeal in Newfoundland, yes, sorry, just as quick, I was just going to ask you, uh, Ms. Spencer, would um, adding constructive knowledge to the doctrine at this point be a beneficial change uh, to the state of the law as a result of the majority in this decision? Yes, so that's just what I was going to get to. Thank you very much, Justice. So as uh, Chief Justice Green at the Newfoundland Court of Appeal did recognize, constructive knowledge should come into play when discussing the, doc the doctrine of unconscionability. So it should be not only that the stronger party must knowingly take advantage of the weaker, they could, they, it could be in a circumstance where they ought to have known they are taking advantage of that. And in that, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. And just to continue in that vein, couldn't we look at the situation and say, um, with, with respect to constructive knowledge, isn't it, it implicit that Uber knows that its drivers don't make much money, they don't get much income from uh, taking up this profession, so there would be constructive knowledge with all of their drivers? Uber would argue no, simply because it is a standard form contract. They're offering the exact same terms to any driver that happens to open either their Uber Eats or Uber apps to sign up to be a driver, and they have no way of knowing who is on the other end of that contract. They don't know their particular circumstances. It wouldn't be fair to Uber to suggest that because someone is working for them, they must automatically assume they aren't making a lot of money. This could be a part-time job for, for anybody. We're not sure of their particular circumstances. So that constructive knowledge, even if they ought to have known, yes, that it's a larger corporation versus an individual, again, that's just going back to the power differential and the the inequality and in bargaining power, not necessarily to the knowledge component that they were exploiting this particular relationship. So it cannot be said that Uber particularly knew that this clause was so detrimental to Mr. Heller's particular circumstances because they were offering the same contract to anyone who signed up on that app. Um, Ms. Spencer, just to follow up on, on the uh, Constructive knowledge, I, I noticed at one point in the written submissions, uh, Uber's position is that the majority uh, should have uh, or, or did err by admitting the constructive knowledge as well as the concept of grossly improvident bargain. And I'm, I'm just wondering what, can you give us an example if, if this particular uh, standard form contract would not fall into um, an unconscionable uh, contract 
by Uber's assessment, what would, what would be uh, something that would be an example of a, a gr grossly improvident bargain? Can, can you give us a, some, an example of, of what you mean by that? Uh, certainly, Je Chief Justice. Um, it is Uber's position that it is not grossly improvident because Mr. Heller and Uber both have to pay that same arbitration fee if they want to enter into arbitration. And there is also other methods of dispute resolution that Mr. Heller can take besides taking this one. An unconscionable or grossly unfair would be if only Mr. Heller had to pay this fine if he was the one to start a proceeding versus if Uber could just bring their claim free of charge. Obviously, this would be using their larger status to their benefit because they can afford it, but they're not paying for it. And they're expecting the, the smaller guy to be able to pay for it. So that's unjust in that sense. Isn't the real problem that Uber has, though, is the class action possibility, not so much the individual suit? I would assume Uber wouldn't be all that upset if Mr. Heller started an action in the New Brunswick Court of Queen's Bench or in some other superior court in Canada. What Uber doesn't want is a $400 million class action brought by Mr. Heller. Why, don't you, why doesn't Uber just address it, the real problem directly instead of doing it through this sort of dance of the seven veils with an arbitration clause in the Netherlands? Uh, respectively, Justice Cromwell, that is what Uber is trying to do. It set out from the beginning what the method of dispute resolution would have to be if any disputes did arise. And Mr. Heller is not abiding by those regulations as he agreed to them. So Uber is trying to get its justice in, in, in uh, enforcing the clauses and agreements that both parties willingly agreed to and were both acceptable to. Um, and Uber just wants those terms of the contract to be fulfilled. Yes, Justice Quigg. Uh, with respect to the clause that we're looking at, um, how does applying the unconscionability doctrine to a single clause in what I'm assuming is a rather large contract detract from certainty in uh, contract negotiations between parties like this? Um, well, it would, it would affect certainty because a, a company or the individual would never quite know what would be upheld in court and what wouldn't. So even in reading through these standard form contracts, someone could read through and agree to them and then in the back of their mind having the knowledge of, oh, I can just persecute this later. Or you can have um, situations where you're only including these clauses because you want to have the arbitration later on down the road. So it, it's creating that lack of certainty because you don't know if your contract's going to be fulfilled. You don't know which part is going to be deemed unconscionable, if at all, solely because of the method it was presented in, which was the standard form contract. And if that's the only differentiation, you're not sure which of those clauses are going to be deemed unconscionable and not unconscionable. Uh, I see I am running out of time, so I will just summarize my remarks quickly. Um, individuals must be given the ultimate freedom to contract is the ultimate thing that people highlight in Canadian contracts law. The majority's test limits that, allowing individuals to only enter into contracts with parties with equal bargaining power. Absent any further questions, I will now turn it over to my co-counsel for Uber's submission on the unconscionability of the arbitration clause. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Good evening, Justices. My name is Lucas Savini, and I'll be addressing the second issue of applying the doctrine of unconscionability on behalf of my client, Uber. Uber would like to first address the issues addressed in the factum of the respondent, namely the inequality of bargaining power, as well as the concept of an improvident bargain. And if time permits, Uber would then like to discuss the issues of intent and its applicability in the doctrine of unconscionability, as well as the applicability of single clause unconscionability that we saw in this case. If there are no preliminary questions from the justices, Uber would like to proceed to discuss the issue of inequality of bargaining power. So in respect to the inequality of bargaining power, both the majority and the respondents argue that the correct standard is one where one party is unable to adequately protect their interests. Uber's position is that setting the standard at the point that it was set by both the majority and the respondents trivializes the step in the context of SFCs, as my co-counsel 
Ms. Spencer outlined because of the inherent nature of it being a take it or leave it proposition for one party. Uber's position is that a more appropriate standard was outlined in Kane, where the standard states that it should be an overwhelming imbalance of bargaining power caused by the victim's ignorance of business, illiteracy, ignorance of the language of the bargain, blindness, deafness, illness, senality, or similar disability. Uber believes that this standard better reflects the commercial reality of SFCs and limits the applicability of the unconscionability doctrine to unique circumstances to be applied exceptionally, which is the intent of the doctrine. Uber would also like to address the respondent's characterization of the problem. In the respondent's fact in paragraph 28, the respondent relies on Hunter Engineering as well as Turcon to show that courts have in the past examined inequality of bargaining power and found it not to be present. Uber agrees, sorry, go ahead, Justice. So I noticed that in the respondent submission when I was reviewing it and one thing struck me with respect to that case is that you had very experienced commercial uh, litigants in that case. So shouldn't that be different from the case before us today where we have poor Mr. Heller who is making his living uh, driving for Uber Eats? Yes, Justice, for sure. Uber's position is that it's entirely reasonable the logic used in those cases to arrive at a finding of no inequality of bargaining power. Uber's position differs in the context of business to consumer as opposed to business to business and thinks that the relationship between the two parties is fundamentally different. So as the business to business concepts no longer apply in a business to consumer relationship, or in this case, I suppose a business to individual relationship, essentially the standard of, um, not adequately protecting your interests in relation to a standard form contract where it's take it or leave it scenario in a business to consumer environment is different than in a business to business environment, but at the same time is commercially necessary for proper economic function, especially in the context of a large multinational company like Uber that has contracts like this with thousands of individuals. Yes, Justice? But Mr. Savinia, I wonder just because as you're saying that essentially what you're asking us to do is is take the law and to to take it another step to go in another direction to account for these fundamental changes we're seeing in, in business and personal and contractual relationships that no longer fit into that uh, that model. But doesn't that feed into the question of is this really appropriately before the court is wouldn't it make more sense to go to the legislature and ask that this very situation be addressed and that laws be put in place in order to allow businesses like Uber to function in a global economy uh, in, a li in, in line with the laws that are compliant with Canada and protect both the company as well as uh, Canadian citizens who want to participate in that business. Yes, Justice, my client's position is in line essentially with what you said that the issue my client has is the applicability of the unconscionability doctrine specifically to this problem. It's a better problem solved by the legislature or there are other mechanisms in law capable of addressing this more appropriately than modifying the standard of an otherwise appropriate test that's supposed to be used sparingly to accommodate the specific scenario with Mr. Heller here. And instead of addressing the issue of um, providing recourse to Mr. Heller here, what essentially they're doing is repurposing the cost on the rest of society in taking risk management to be more expensive for large companies like this. In terms of entering in new contracts in the future, it's difficult to manage the risk that this opens up for a company like Uber and the end result will get pushed to end consumers like this with less um, employment opportunities being created in Canada. So instead of addressing the problem, through this method, they're merely shifting the cost on society away from Mr. Heller. And who does not believe that this is an appropriate way to deal with the issue at hand. In moving to the facts of how this was addressed by the court, there was two primary factors that the court used to find an inequality of bargaining power. The first is Mr. Heller's inability to dictate terms, which have been discussed by me and by my co-counsel earlier. The second was Mr. Heller's inability to appreciate the significance of the arbitration clause used to justify their finding as an inequality of bargaining power. 
Uber's position is that it's irrational to expect Mr. Heller or any individual in a standard form contract to appreciate the intricacies involved in any sort of dispute resolution mechanisms. The purpose of the dispute, mecha, uh, sorry, dispute resolution mechanism is to clarify the process by which each party can find recourse, expecting intimate knowledge of the inner machinations of the arbitration process and finding that in absence of such that an inequality of bargaining power is present dissuades companies from including provisions for um, dispute resolution when in fact it's meant to be more efficient for both the justice system and for either party as is the case here Uber believes. So in conclusion Uber's position is that there's no inequality of bargaining power present in the current case. But Mr. Savini, though, how do you reconcile that, though, with Justice Abella's comments in uh, Duezen's Facebook? Uh, while somewhat factually different, uh, she did find that there was uh, inequality of uh, bargaining power in, in circumstances that are quite analogous to what we have here. Isn't that, uh, isn't that persuasive for this court in terms of whether or not there was an inequality of bargaining power? I, I find those two cases, uh, or the current case and that one, to, be, to have several parallels. Uber believes that there is some merit to the question that was posed in the sense that there is some authority to be given to the concurring opinion by Justice Abella and Duaz. However, Uber's position is that the majority opinion in Duaz is more authoritative and on the matter of addressing a similar issue, it was framed as a context of, in the context, sorry, of public policy. Um, an important quote from Duas had to do with, an important quote from Duas states that a clause in an otherwise valid agreement should be enforceable absent public policy concerns, which is from the majority in Duas. Uber believes that that is a more reasonable position than the position of Justice Sabella in trying to extend the doctrine of unconscionability to apply to, to an issue that the majority had solved adequately in a way that does not invoke the doctrine. Yes, Justice? Would it make any difference in this case if Mr. Heller had understood in minute detail the arbitration clause? On the second issue of reasoning there, yes. Maybe not on the first um, issue that they had, which was um, his inability to dictate terms of the standard form contract. So it wouldn't impact that, but based on the reasoning of what they said, the majority in this case said that had the clause been more explicit in terms of clarifying that the arbitration would take place in the Netherlands, et cetera, if he had understood it more than it wouldn't have applied here, which is an issue that the dissent took with the reasoning of the majority, but based on the reasoning of the majority, yes, it would make a difference. Is there anything, do you think, that could be done to make the, Mr. Heller have equal bargaining power to Uber? Probably in terms of uh, if, uh, in a fantastical scenario where we can make up what would happen, then sure, they could go to the table and negotiate a, a contract where he has equal bargaining power, could be deemed to have um, equal bargaining power. It's just commercially unworkable for that to be the case for a large multinational like Uber to be able to do that with every person that they have a contract with, which is why it's a necessity that contracts are done in the way that they're done in standard form procedure. And in addition to that, why it should be enforceable and it's important for proper economic function for it to be enforceable and to put some responsibility on the party signing the contract as well. They're not forced or they're not under duress to sign the contract. Mr. Heller in this case chose to opt into a contract and be bound by what it said. He could have easily said no and chose not to. So that's Uber's position. Yes, Justice. Yep. Continuing in that vein, I found uh, Justice Cote's comments regarding the cost, because the cost was 14000 or 14500 to uh, go into this arbitration. Um, and I found her discussion of, of the, the situation in Canada wouldn't be much different. I mean, aside from having to go to the Netherlands, perhaps, to, to continue with it. But 
the costs wouldn't be that much different, would they, if you had uh, undertaken this in Canada? Yes, Justice. The position is that that is correct and that the problem is being mischaracterized in terms of looking at the quantum of the cost of an arbitration proceeding and wrongfully perceiving it as a fine or some other costs. For example, the case referred to by the respondents in respect to an improvident bargain of Birch is about a penalty clause. It's, it's, it's similar, but it's about, a, it's about a penalty clause in which the penalty clause was found to be unconscionable. It's, it's more clear in that example who's being unduly advantaged, who's being unduly disadvantaged, which doesn't really apply to an arbitration clause here. Yes, I understand that the cost of dispute resolution and litigation in general in Canada and other countries is expensive and this ex principle extends to arbitration as well. But it's different from a fine in that one party is not unduly advantaged or disadvantaged in this case. Both a company and an individual might have to pay the same amount to engage in arbitration, but the purpose of that is because they're buying the same good. It doesn't make sense that because Uber is much larger and makes more money than an individual would that they should pay more or less for anything else. It would be ridiculous for Uber to pay a hundred times more for office supplies than Mr. Heller would just because of the discrepancy in income. The same principle applies to the cost of justice in Canada, justice abroad. And there's a reason why cost provisions are often included in these sorts of dispute mechanisms, right? So it limits trivial claims and also allocates costs more appropriately to where they should be born for bringing an action. So looking at everything from a bird's eye view, I guess, wouldn't Justice Brown's concurrence on the basis of public policy be preferable to relying on, on unconscionability? Justice Brown, while, while not being at issue currently, the issue of public policy, based on the majority in Duas, the appropriate venue for exploring whether this clause should be voided or not should be through the lens of public policy which going back to what I had recited earlier about what Duas said about the issue in that a clause is enforceable in an otherwise valid agreement unless there's public policy concerns. I don't think anyone has raised any issues in regards to the case at bar, the whole agreement being unconscionable in any fashion. As such, the most authoritative source should be the majority in Duas rather than just the Bell's minority in Duas and public policy would be the appropriate lens to view whether it would or would not qualify. So moving towards the argument of the improvident bargain, I know that I'm short on time, so I will briefly summarize my findings. Essentially, like we discussed, because this is an arbitration clause, it's not a penalty clause, there's no evidence that one party is unduly advantaged or disadvantaged, it would be inappropriate to characterize Mr. Heller paying for an arbitration proceeding, which is an inherently fair process and the inclusion in the contract is not included for the benefit of Uber. Yes, sorry, but, Justice. But just on that, Mr. Savini, if I mean, if we have to look at a Mr. Heller's circumstance here and, and if the cost of the arbitration coupled with the requirement to travel to the Netherlands essentially for him is a total barrier. That just renders the whole arbitration clauseless. As we can imagine, several people in his situation, it would be the same. Then don't you have to look at that? If the clause itself, uh, when applied to the specific individuals, rend puts up a barrier that is insurmountable, um, don't we have to look at that? My client believes that access to justice is an important issue and certainly might be an issue in the case of Mr. Heller. My client's contention with that assertion is that it's not a decision to be made by the court under the doctrine of unconscionability as to whether that is the case here. It's possible there's precedent for the court to strike out the clause based on public policy. And my client also believes that it's entirely appropriate to forward the question to the arbiter in the Netherlands if it's unworkable for the clients. It's likely to be the case that it would be allowed to be heard in Canada and in, um, to alleviate some of the concerns. The primary issue that my client has is that the arbitration as a mechanism 
is an appropriate field to decide this issue. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sabini. We're going to have to stop you there as we're out of time. Um, thank you, Justice. Are the, the, uh, thank you very much. Are uh, the residents ready to proceed? Mr. Connolly or Mr. Smith? Good evening, Chief Justice and Justices. Uh, Please proceed. My name is Matthew Smith, and I'm appearing on behalf of uh, Mr. Heller along with my co counsel, Aaron Connolly. This evening, I will be addressing the first issue in the respondent's factum regarding the test for unconscionability. The majority in the case of Barr has outlined the test for unconscionability as containing the following two branches that there be an inequality of bargaining power and that there be a resulting improvident bargain. While the dissent here submits that the test for unconscionability requires three branches, the first being that there be a significant inequality of bargaining power stemming from a weakness or vulnerability, a resulting improvident bargain, and that the stronger have knowledge of the weaker party's vulnerability. Respectfully, respectfully, Mr. Hillier submits that the majority has outlined the appropriate test for unconscionability for the following two reasons. First, the two branches as outlined are the result of careful and considered jurisprudential evolution. And second, the exclusion of a knowledge requirement branch is appropriate because it is not relevant to the purpose of the test. Mr. Hiller sees the key differences between the two tests used as being the like, uh, I think we have a question from Justice Smith or, or Justice Quigg, go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask Mr. Smith, uh, doesn't the majority opinion lower the threshold for a finding of inequality to a level that it is practically meaningless now? Certainly that is the argument that could be made. Uh, however, regarding inequality, the test for unconscionability through this evolution, we've seen it beginning even with Morrison in, back in 1965, uh, the threshold may even appear much higher as requiring proof of inequality and requiring to prove ignorance or need or distress. Uh, this was affirmed in Harry in 1975, of course, uh, but Justice Laforet in 1992 in Norberg did reduce uh, or has apparently reduced uh, this level down to proof of inequality in the positions of the party where he did specifically remove specific examples like need and distress. So yes, it would appear it would appear that the threshold has been lowered some. However, this is in keeping with Justice Lafore at the Supreme Court of Canada in Norberg. The uh, the, this obviously the second most significant difference between the two tests is the knowledge requirement uh, component, which I will address later. Uh, regarding the inequality, though, uh, Mr. Hiller submits that regarding the first branch of the test, removing of specific examples for inequality from Morrison to what's seen through Norberg and then what is seen here, uh, Birch outlines that there is no fixed criteria for establishing inequality and in bargaining power. And the majority states as much when they hold that any inequality exists when one party cannot adequately protect their interests in the contracting process, and that there are no rigid limitations to this. Mr. Heller agrees, uh, and an inequality can arise out of any number of scenarios, and that surely it's for the court to decide if a particular inequality rises to the level of a party being unable to protect their interests. Mr. Smith, this I really start. just give judges a virtually unchanneled discretion to set aside bargains that have been freely entered into. I think that we have to rely on, in, in this particular case, it's important to rely and trust the bench and the judges to look at the individual facts of a case and determine in that moment whether or not the specific facts of that case would warrant an inequality. So uh, unlimited, I don't think so, but certainly, yes, Mr. Justice Cromwell, uh, it does allow for the justices or the, the court at bar to make that determination. But you, you marry this discretion with the class action procedure and what you get uh, at least on one version of what you get, is a tremendous hammer in Mr. Heller's hands to hold over Uber. Because if you go, if the downside for the company is 400 million bucks and the legal test is written in jelly, 
some money is going to change hands. Certainly, that's a very fair uh, a fair observation to make, Justice Cromwell. Um, in this particular circumstances, Mr. Heller would suggest that it's very important that, especially in standard form contracts, when we're dealing with uh, a large corporation like Uber and a smaller individual like Mr. Heller, that there should be a requirement on the larger party to make sure that they're being as fair and just as, pro as, fair and just as possible, that they're not taking advantage. Uh, certainly, I, I, can see, uh, I can see your comment as something that may spin out of control, but I think as we move through the, the case law and we move through this, that what will actually come out will be a, a solid test that really requires the larger, the larger party, the stronger party to not take advantage either deliberately or by accident of the smaller party through contractual processes. But Mr. Smith, just on that point, Point. Doesn't uh, adopting the, the three-pronged test as, as suggested in the dissenting opinion, doesn't that incorporate the balance that uh, now uh, may be missing if, if this, if this decision is allowed to stand in the sense that by once you put in the knowledge component, uh, then large companies such as Uber are, are free uh, to do what they like. Mr. Heller's free to contract with whom he likes, but there is a, there is a moderating force. There's another uh, third test that's present that can be used by courts in 2020 who are dealing with the realities of the 2020 economy. Doesn't it just seem like that's an, a logical evolution that actually provides protection to all parties? Uh, certainly, Chief Justice, uh... When, when we phrase it in that way, uh, certainly that seems very logical and I would agree with you. However, uh, Mr. Heller would submit that the purpose of unconscionability is about protecting the vulnerable party. We see this coming from Justice Lafrey's remarks in Norberg's that the purpose of this test is to protect the weaker party in the drafting process from an improvident bargain. And so it's not so much about punishing the, the stronger party. It's not about completely undoing it. It's just having a, a safety valve that's left there that, yes, Justice Quigg? So the way that I read the uh, majority of the Supreme Court of Canada now, it, it seems to me that unconscionability can practically be triggered without any wrongdoing now. And that, does, does that seem fair to you? Uh, yes, Mr. Heller would submit that uh, again, uh, relying on Justice Lafourier's remarks in Norberg, uh, the test for unconscionability is about protecting the vulnerable party and not about punishing the stronger party. And so it's not about, uh, it's not about uh, putting punishments in place. It's about having that safety valve. So, yeah. Regarding the first branch of the test, again, uh, regarding inequality of bargaining power, uh, Morris and Harry and Norberg further present that the first further present the first branch of the test without the use of significant to qualify a specific inequality. While the test proposed by Justice Cote in dissent here does include this qualifier, in Downer, Justice Green. Uh, notes that specifically when discussing improvidence and not inequality, uh, that debating in a particular case whether uh, debating in a particular case whether there was an overwhelming imbalance or whether a transaction was grossly or merely substantially unfair is a sterile and artificial exercise, and that such adjectives will be uh, and that uh, such adjectives have different meanings depending on who's employing them. Now, while the court in Downer does not em does employ the use of significant in their inequality uh, branch, they do caution about falling into this ling linguistic trap uh, where different phrasing is interpreted differently by different parties. Uh, Mr. That's Heller, was is it, excuse me just for one second. Is it your position that after the court knocks out the arbitration clause that Uber continues to be bound by the rest of the contract? Certainly, the, the issue with the case of art here is specific, to, uh, is specific to the arbitration clause. Uh, I'm so, sorry, Justice Carmel, could you repeat the question? If, if, we, if the court knocks out the arbitration clause is unconscionable, is it your position uh, 
that Uber remains bound by the rest of the contract? Yes. So uh, at issue on the facts of the case as we have them, uh, we are only looking to interrupt the arbitration clause as being unconscionable. Yes. Is that is that fair? I mean, presumably if Uber had known that this was going to be not part of the contract, they wouldn't have entered into it. Uh, regarding regarding fairness, yes, I suppose it is fair. Um, Uber did present a standard form contract to Mr. Heller. Um, Mr. Heller entered into it and is now finding a term of it to be unconscionable. Um, they drafted the contract. They they were in. They they had that that stronger power of dictating all of the terms of this particular contract. So Mr. Uber taking the position that this particular arbitration clause is unconscionable uh, would seem to Mr. Hoop to would seem to uh, Mr. Heller to be fair. Yes. Gets to file his three hundred complaints and to be an Uber driver, but Uber doesn't get the arbitration clause. How is that fair? Uh, the could you repeat the question again, Justice Cromwell? Yes. Under your submission, as I'm understanding it, Mr. Heller gets to file his 300 complaints and presumably any other number he wants. And Uber, uh, he gets to be an Uber driver, but Uber doesn't get the protection that it wanted in the arbitration clause. Well, certainly at the heart of the unconscionability of the arbitration clause is that Mr. Heller certainly has no other issues with the employment contract, at least based on the facts that we're working with today. Um, Mr. Heller, as- With respect, he seemed to have 300 problems with it over the course of his employment. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, uh, Justice Cromwell. Um, Mr. Uber, as a private uh, citizen, as an employee, is certainly free to avail himself of the justice system as he sees fit, as is Uber, of course. Um, in this particular case, uh, we are concerned about the unconscionability of this particular, uh, of this particular arbitration clause. And so uh, aside from that, uh, aside from that, our issue is with the unconscionability clause and whether or not the test for unconscionability today is the correct one that was adopted by the court at the Supreme Court of Canada. Mr. Smith, if I can just ask you a, um, some, a, a factual question, perhaps, and this may be in the materials and I missed it, but my understanding of Mr. Heller's personal situation is uh, that while, of course, he maintains there was an inequality in bargaining uh, between himself and Uber, uh, we understand that, but, but he's not an individual who him himself is, is indicating he personally uh, suffers from an exceptional circumstance in terms of a language barrier or a a educational barrier or any sort of um, situation like that that we often see in these matters. My understanding, Mr. Heller's not advancing uh, any exceptional circumstances with respect to his personal situation? No, uh, that's correct, uh, Chief Justice DeWare. Um, specifically, though, we know that, uh, again, regarding to the inequality uh, branch, that really is, it's, it's Mr. Heller's position that that is for the court to decide if his position alone warrants that inequality. So Mr. Heller is an individual and Uber is a big billion dollar corporation. Now we know from, uh, we know from the case law that it is to the court to decide whether or not a person's inequality rises to that level. But no, to answer your question, uh, aside from their economic uh, differences in bargaining power that Mr. Heller is not putting anything else forward. Specifically around standard form contracts, uh, the appellants in this case uh, agree with the dissent that it is correct. Uh, they agree with the dissent that uh, to allow a standard form contract to impact inability uh, to impact uh, to impact inequality of bargaining power would set the threshold so low that it would be practically meaningless. However, we see both in Birch and in Duez uh, that a person's inability to negotiate within the context of a standard form contract uh, is appropriate, is allowed. 
Uh, that isn't to say that all instances of standard form contracts will rise to the level of inequality, but rather that it may be used as evidence as such. Yes, uh, Justice Quaid. Mr. Smith, can I ask you another question, please? So when we look at all of this and uh, what the majority wrote, isn't the implication of their position, um, isn't it that all of Uber's employment contracts are un unconscionable merely because the terms can't be negotiated? No, Justice Quigg, it's our understanding and our point and our position rather that um, specifically the arbitration clause is the, is the issue. The, 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 when we look at the issue, when we look at the issues of the, uh, on, the, on the facts in front of us, uh, we are not concerned with the, entire, with the entire employment agreement. We are only concerned about the arbitration clause. Um, it, the, specifically because the, 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 pardon me, the amount of arbitration, the cost of arbitration was not included in the contract. And so Mr. Heller was unaware of that at the time. That, that was a key factor in our decision here. Uh, I and, then, and then can I not ask you the same question I asked your, um, your friend earlier? It's expensive to go, whether you go to court or whether you have uh, an arbitration. Um, Mr. Heller must have known that when he entered into that contract. If there's going to be arbitration, there are going to be costs. And you look at the situation we're in today, we're doing this virtually. Um, perhaps it could, the arbitration could be done virtually through the rules of arbitration in the Netherlands. That's a very fair point uh, to make, Justice Quigg. Um, on the facts of the case, we are seeing that it's going to cost about 14500 US is what the costs are. Now, certainly if there were other means put forward, that would have to be something that would be examined. Um, but as a, as a person who is not familiar with the judicial system as Mr. Heller is, um, I, do, I, I would not say it's fair to characterize him as knowing fully understanding the amount of arbitration or how much that would cost or even being able to put his mind to what it would look like if he had to get into an arbitration with Uber. And I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but I, I see that we're encroaching onto your uh, colleague's time. Perhaps if, if you could just very quickly wrap up your comments. Certainly. Uh, thank you very much, Justices. Uh, to summarize, the majority's two-part test for unconscionability is the appropriate test because the two branches requiring a providence are the result of carrot, careful jurisprudential evolution. We saw this coming from Morrison through Harry and into Norberg. And the deliberate exclusion of a knowledge-based branch is necessary because as we saw from Justice Luffer and Norberg, knowledge and knowledge and punishment is not the purpose of the test. The purpose of the test is to provide relief to a weaker party in the absence of an, of an improvident, or in the presence of an improvident bargain. And that will conclude my oral submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good evening, Chief Justice and Justices. My name is Aaron Connolly, and as my colleague, Mr. Smith has noted, I will be addressing the second issue on appeal. Uh, that is whether the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada correctly decided in their application of the facts to their adopted test for unconscionability. Un uh, Mr. Heller respectively submits that the proper decision was reached. Um, and be on behalf of Mr. Heller, I will address three points to support his submission. First, on behalf of Mr. Heller, I will address the inequality of bargaining power as well as the concerns expressed by Justice Cote as they relate to the threshold that she had set for an inequality of bargaining power. Second, on behalf of Mr. Heller, I will address the improvidence of the bargain. And lastly, I will talk about uh, future, potential future implications of the decision um, as they relate to public concern. Um, so unless there are any preliminary questions, I will turn to the first point. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Connolly, thank you. Okay, so before starting, I would like to say that Mr. Heller is aware that the following cases to be discussed are not binding uh, as they came from concurring their judgments or dissenting judgments or stated in obiter. Um, but that being said, the first case that will be discussed on behalf of Mr. Heller is Duez versus Facebook. Uh, and Mr. Heller believes that that is a persuasive case, especially uh, in the circumstances, as was mentioned earlier to my friend, Mr. Savini, on opposing counsel, the 
situation in that case was quite analogous to the case at bar. Um, and as you can see, if I can turn your attention to page eight of the respondent's factum. At paragraph 34, you can see where Justice Abella went through her reasoning and her final conclusion um, that within this online contract, um, the standard form contract, it gave Facebook the unilateral ability to require that any legal grievances Ms. Dua has had could not be vindicated in British Columbia uh, where the contract was made, but only in California where Facebook had its head office. So based on that line of reasoning, it seems quite analogous to the situation at hand where the contract was made in Canada or with a, a staff member of Uber in Canada to work as an Uber driver, but any grievances that arose had to be settled with arbitration under the, uh, the legislature or the jurisdiction of the Netherlands, which caused Mr. Uber to have to travel to the Netherlands. So just based on that, um, it seems like the inequality there is sufficient, but on top of that, it was also the price of arbitration was left out in the contract. So it is noted by the by Justices Abella and Rowe that someone in Uber's or in Mr. Heller's position likely did not understand the legal implications of the arbitration agreement. But even if that were the case, there was still no direction to him or information given to him about what the cost would be if a dispute was to arise. So on top of that, we Mr. Heller respectfully submits that there was a sufficient inequality of bargaining power here under the doctrine of unconscionability. And now to address the concerns. Well, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but would it seriously have made any difference if he'd known all that? He still had no bargaining power, period. Well, yeah, that's another thing as well is there's no bargaining power. So uh, I'll jump to my third point because uh, Mr. Heller, or speaking on behalf of Mr. Heller, would believe that this could be a good place to answer that question. I'm um, looking at the future potential implications. So what Mr. Heller submits is that this case could hold true to all standard form contracts going forward as they are, as been mentioned by my friends on opposing counsel, they are very important in the modern day economy and business practices. But with a decision like this, Mr. Heller believes that parties forming these standard form contracts should be very clear and direct in what they're doing. And in that way, we can actually get back to the notion of freedom of contract, where even though Mr. Heller is unable to negotiate, he at least can be reassured that his best interests are put forth within the contract. Although he was not able to negotiate that, he can read through and understand exactly what is in the contracts themselves. Does that answer your question, Justice Cromwell? I, th I think so, although I'm left a little unsure as to what we do with the knowledge versus the inability to bargain because the majority as your friend pointed out seem to rely on both and yet if the basic test is one of inequality of bargaining the knowledge in a case like this doesn't seem to matter much so i'm just not sure what we do with that element uh, well as you can see and as my colleague mr smith has mentioned and as had been mentioned, uh, I believe by, I'm sorry if it was Justice DeWare, Justice Quigg, but had mentioned uh, the test was first articulated this way by Justice Lafouray in Norberg. And it's remained relatively consistent, not through the courts of appeal, but through the times that unconscionability, unconscionability has been addressed in the Supreme Court of Canada. They stick to this two prong test of merely an inequality of bargaining power and an improvident bargain. So Mr. Heller submits that the knowledge is not required within the adopted test. But uh, Mr. Connolly, if I can just stop you there. Um, how, I mean, we, we can't keep the doctrine of, of unconscionability in, in the dark ages either. I mean, this is the reality of 2020. Um, this is the reality of a global economy of standard form contracts that uh, are required for people to get involved in, in certain uh, business ventures for businesses to, to invest in communities and in countries and how it seems like the the test even in 92 92 wasn't that long ago but it the the world the business world of today where these contracts are formed bears no resemblance so 
uh, as we mourn RBG today, the great dissenter, uh, you know, dissents are often just decisions that were a few months too early. Uh, aren't we there? Aren't we really at the point that we need to accept that uh, this test, uh, while very helpful, needs to be evolved and the knowledge component seems to be the most logical way to do that in a way that actually respects freedom of contract while maintaining the relevance of the doctrine of unconscionability. Mr. Heller can agree with your point, but there may also be concern with that knowledge component um, in the formation of standard form contracts. This is a presumption Mr. Heller puts forth, but it could potentially be that if that were the case, that if there's a knowledge requirement, then companies forming these standard form contracts could add in things that essentially make their advantage more undue to the weaker party because then if they are aware, if there is a grievance brought, whether it be to arbitration or under the jurisdiction of the Canadian courts, they have to, the opposing party bringing that has to be able to prove that subjective knowledge, which makes it much more difficult. Yes, Justice Quick. Continuing in that vein, um, don't you think that by eliminating the knowledge requirement, um, didn't the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't it end up uh, in undermining the principle of finality and predictability? You can't have these things going on forever. So Mr. Heller signed the contract and say it went on for 10 years. And then all of a sudden he decides he needs to use the arbitration clause and then boom, this all pops up at that point. These things will never end. And I think that they've eroded uh, predictability and finality. Yeah. Mr. Heller understands your point. And again, too, I'll turn to the future potential implications or the considerations from a public standpoint. What, we, what Mr. Heller believes this case can do is not necessarily put pressure, but companies forming these standard form contracts have to be aware now that they have to be clear. They can't hide things and wait for a dispute and then have it in a manner that they dictate the terms of. Um, and another thing with that too is I can look at page seven of the respondent's factum. Uh, again, as stated, Mr. Heller is aware that uh, Synchro Canada versus Hunter Engineering, as well as Turcon versus BC, are not binding cases. But when unconscionability was addressed in those cases, uh, it was found that there wasn't that sufficient level of inequality to be found. So I, we don't believe it reaches that sweeping restriction. Uh, I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, Justice Quigg, but if you want me to clarify, would you be able to repeat the question? That's fine. You can continue, Mr. Conley. Thank you. Well, this whole test you're relying on, though, rests on a pretty shaky uh, jurisprudential basis, doesn't it? Justice Lafrey's judgment in Weinrib, number one, was dealing with consent to sexual assault, and number two, wasn't a majority judgment. Justice Abella's judgment in Do As In Facebook was a concurring judgment, I think, for one or two of her colleagues. And then we have the judgment that we're, uh, we're concerned with here, but it's not as if there's some great jurisprudential tradition in Canada that you're relying on, is there? No, certainly not, Justice Cromwell, and that has made it difficult to argue that this is certainly the test as you can see across this uh, courts of appeal across the nation, they've been adopting different tests, but based on the jurisprudence from the Supreme Court of Canada, although, although not majority decisions thus far, uh, minus the decision in Uber, we feel that those are the best cases to rely on as those are the cases that have maintained the same consistency th throughout the use of their test. But um, although not in my factum, there are cases such as Titus versus William F. Cook Enterprises, where although a different test is used, you're looking at an employer and an employee, and that was a majority decision in the Court of Appeal, uh, and found that there was no inequality uh, within the standard form severance package that he was given because he was a senior lawyer at the corporation, and that gave him enough ability, although unable to negotiate terms. And you can see, so that is some strong jurisprudence, not just from the Supreme Court of Canada, and as said, um, 
non-majority decisions, but you can see from courts of appeal as well in majority decisions that they're assessing them in similar ways. Um, I just uh, wonder, Mr. Connolly, what you what you thought of the Saskatchewan Court of Appeals approach uh, in Hess as well as Input Capital, because they seem to to arrive at a workable um, notion of how that could be adopted. I'm wondering what to, what to say to that approach. I'm sorry, Chief Justice DeWare, you cut out there a little bit. I'm not sure if that was just for me. Uh, if you could please repeat the question. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what uh, you thought of the approach of the Saskatchewan. No, I'm lost. Okay. I Can you hear me? Now. Yep. Now we can. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, well, I see, Mr. Connolly, you're, you're out, of town, out of time. My question was just briefly, uh, your thoughts on the Saskatchewan Court of Appeals uh, approach, how they've addressed uh, the notion of the knowledge of inequality in their decisions in Hess and Input cam Capital. Doesn't that provide a bit of a roadmap of what we could do here? In regard to the test adopted or the application of the facts to their adopted test, or both? In regards to the test they adopted. Yes, certainly. And as I had mentioned on behalf of Mr. Heller, there has been a, a variety of tests adopted through Ontario or throughout the course of appeal across Canada. You can see that one. Um, for example, uh, Downer versus Pitcher in the Newfoundland Court of Appeal adopted an even more extensive test. Uh, but Mr. Heller believes that this two-prong test is concise and it's worked, and it seems to be the one that remains the most consistent throughout. And it sticks true to the whole purpose of the doctrine of unconscionability, which is protection of the weaker parties. And as I had reached, or previously mentioned on behalf of Mr. Heller, there is concern potentially with that knowledge requirement or with those extra requirements that the doctrine itself actually strays away from its initial purpose. Okay, thank you, Mr. Connolly. And I just see that uh, you're out of time. Uh, anything else you'd like to say in, in a brief uh, 10, 20 seconds to wrap up? Yeah, just to address the improvidence itself, um, I had, Mr. Heller had relied on the jurisprudence from Birch versus uh, Union of Local Taxation Employees uh, to show that in that case, a fine that amounted to the gross sum of a daily wage was found to be improvident. And here you have a clause, an arbitration clause, which to initiate arbitration amounts to just over the gross amount, or just under, sorry, the gross amount of Mr. Heller's salary. That does not include travel fees, accommodation fees to the Netherlands. And lastly, just to reiterate Mr. Heller's submission that a decision like this is in the best public interest for contractual security going forward as standard form contract continue to be a vital part of the growing economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Um, I, I know we're, we're out of t time, but I will ask uh, Ms. Spencer if there was uh, any uh, reply, which uh, would obviously by necessity be brief. <laughs> Uh, yes, Chief Justice, just briefly as a word of reply, uh, Uber would like to remind the court that despite what Mr. Heller has asserted, the current test of unconscionability as defined by the Supreme Court majority does not force companies to be any more direct in their clauses. And had Uber put that figure in its actual agreement, that would not change the power of the bargaining, uh, the position of the bargaining parties, nor would it change the amount of the arbitration cost. So the current test is not in fact making employers be more direct in their application and their use of SFCs. It is preventing them from using them completely based on the oversweeping restriction on unconscionability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Spencer, um, and thank you everyone for your able submissions. Uh, the court will now um, adjourn uh, to deliberate uh, the matter and uh, we hope to be back at 6.30. Thank you. Okay, I believe I can see um, Justice Cromwell and Justice Quigg, so the panel has reconvened. Um, after what you can imagine uh, were very difficult deliberations, um, 
we have uh, determined the recipients for the Harrison Shield moot for 2020. Uh, it has to be recognized that the time and effort put into all participants uh, in this moot is evident. If only the lawyers we see in our courts every day could be as well prepared and eloquent and versed in the law as um, these four uh, soon to be lawyers are, we would be in extraordinarily good shape. So on behalf of myself and my co-panelists, I'd like to sincerely thank each and every one of you uh, for putting in what was obviously uh, an enormous effort to be so well prepared uh, today in both your written and oral submissions. So thank you for that. Um, after again uh, difficult deliberations, uh, we have come to the determination that the recipients of the Harrison Shield moot for 2020 are Alden Spencer and Lucas Savini. Congratulations again uh, to all mooters and in particular uh, Ms. Spencer and uh, Mr. Savini. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Uh, congratulations Alden and, and, and Lucas and to all of our uh, for competitors for an outstanding performance. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Mr. Heed to present the Harrison Shield uh, to Alden Spencer. Uh, Lucas, you, I guess you're going to be accepting this in spirit virtually, uh, but don't worry, the pandemic won't last forever. You're going to get to come back to UMB Law. You're going to see your name engraved in, on the shield along uh, with, uh, with Alden. So um, Bill and, and, and Alden, now let's present the shield. Well, as Chief Justice uh, DeWare said, four great presentations and a lot of work by all, but to you and your colleague, congratulations. Thank you. And your name will soon be there. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. It's thank all yours. So, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, uh, Chief Justice and uh, Justices, to our friends who are watching all over the country, uh, I wanna thank you so much for your participation in the Harrison Moot uh, this evening. As has already been said, uh, what a tremendous effort uh, by all four of our uh, participants. Um, I wanna thank everyone for being involved in this. It really is uh, part of what makes UNB Law so special. So. Uh, thanks again for tuning in, everyone, and have a good evening.